Okay, so here we're going to talk about one of the most common cancers in the United States, and that is colon cancer. And we'll also talk about some syndromes, some inherited syndromes that raise your risk of colon cancer. Those are not tested as much, um, but you are going to need to know. Again, as I told you um, in a previous talk, the USMLE really, really, really hammers hard on ambulatory medicine, preventative medicine. That's a bigger and bigger deal because it helps reduce costs. Um, now, some of the uh, recommendations from the ACG and the American Cancer Society have changed since I made my last video. Um, so that is a big reason why I'm updating uh, this talk. Okay, and we'll see how those change, uh, how, how those actually changed. Okay. So uh, if you haven't had the chance yet, please consider subscribing to my Patreon. You can get there by clicking the link in the description of the video or by clicking the I button in the upper right hand corner. I very much appreciate all the contributions I can get to help offset the cost of these videos. And I thank all those of you who have already donated and certainly feel free to subscribe to my channel and you will get updates as I put more and more videos up. Okay, so we're talking about malignancies here. And a number of syndromes, um, I want you to have a passing knowledge at least of those, um, but they're not quite tested as heavily as they would be on step one, for instance. So colon cancer is an adenocarcinoma. It's one of the most common causes in the U.S., and it has a lifetime prevalence of around 5 to 6%, meaning about 1 in 18 to 1 in 20 people will get diagnosed with colon cancer in their lifetime. So it's a pretty significant uh, number of people. The risk is slightly increased with things like red meat, a high-fat diet, and smoking, things that happen a lot in the United States, at least the first two. Smoking is a little less common now than it was 20, 30 years ago. The risk is greatly reduced by proper preventative measures, i.e. getting your colonoscopy, so important. The symptoms are gonna depend on the location of the tumor. We're gonna go into that. And the diagnosis here, the only way that you can diagnose colon cancer is a colonoscopy with a biopsy. And naturally that is also going to be the most accurate test. Biopsy is always gonna be the most accurate test. Now, when are we gonna do colonoscopy with biopsy? At their preventative routine surveillance visits. And if you have an older person with a GI bleed. So in other words, they poop and they have blood in the, uh, in the toilet. Um, so um, those are the two instances in which you're going to do this. So I want you to be aware that if you have a patient with a lower GI bleed, once you've ruled out things like diverticulitis, then you're going to get a colonoscopy with a biopsy. So I should say make sure with a lower GI bleed, exclude diverticulitis because we don't want to go in with a scope if we have, for instance, a rupture. Now, the, the symptoms of colon cancer depend on the side that it's on. So if it's on the right side, um, you're not going to see a whole lot. And this is the problem with a right-sided cancer is that it takes a long time for this to cause symptoms. And often it doesn't cause symptoms until the patient has metastasis. So what you may see, what you would see, uh, however, you're not often doing this on asymptomatic people, is occult blood in the stool. The stools are going to be brown, uh, but if you were to do an occult blood test uh, or occult stool test for blood, um, you will see a positive result. The, the problem is we just, we don't do it in asymptomatic people. Uh, you'll also have a normal caliber stool, and we'll get to why that is. Uh, they may have an anemia, especially if they're having this chronic trickling blood loss. So look for an iron deficiency anemia. And like I said, this tends to present later because the symptoms are less dramatic and more insidious. Whereas on the left side, they may have occult blood or it may be visible. On the USMLE, they'll probably tell you it's visible if they want you to know the difference between left and right. Uh, so they could have brown stool or they could have red stool or it could be maroon somewhere in between they will tend to have a decreased caliber, particularly the lower it gets. So if it's down here in the sigmoid, uh, up here, or particularly in the rectum, when we're talking about colon cancer, it's actually called colorectal cancer, so it can be in the rectum. That is going to uh, decrease the stool caliber just because the stool has to push around the tumor. And like I said, this can have anemia too, and this tends to present sooner because if a patient sees maroon stools, or if they notice their stools are all stringy and thin, or if um, they uh, 
for whatever reason are anemic, um, that's one of the things you need to think of. Blood loss in an older person, anemia in an older person, should always be thinking of the possibility of colon cancer. Get an occult blood test. If it's positive, off to colonoscopy. So um, going further, uh, the treatment is, uh, if they do have colon cancer, uh, we want to stage it. That's beyond the scope of this test. Localized disease is going to be resected surgically. Once you diagnose them, you want to check for metastasis. So you're getting a chest x-ray, abdomen, pelvis, CT, and liver function tests, looking for lung, abdominal, and hepatic metastasis. You also want to get a baseline CAA level. That is a marker for these tumors, and it will help us determine um, how well the patient is responding to treatment. Uh, widespread disease, we give chemotherapy. Traditionally, this is based on 5-fluorouracil. However, there are a lot of chemotherapeutic agents. You will not be expected to know those chemo drugs. To follow up, we get serial CEA levels, serial chest x-rays, serial abdominal CTs, and serial, serial liver function tests to monitor for metastasis. All right, so, uh, and recurrence as far as CA levels. You do not need to know uh, how often to get these. You, you just know that we do need to follow these patients up and we're looking for metastasis and recurrence, recurrence through that CEA um, carcinoembryonic antigen, I think it's called. Uh, so make sure and get that. Now for surveillance, uh, the general population, we start screening at 45 years old and repeat every 10 years. If they have a dysplastic polyp, so they have a polyp, you take the polyp out and you send it off to, to pathology and they say it's dysplastic, then you're going to repeat in three to five years. That's because dysplastic polyps tend to be malignant or pre-malignant, whereas hyperplastic or hamartomatous polyps are usually benign. Now, there's a lot of pathologic features that you probably had to know, you did have to know for step one, not quite as important for two and three. So, you know, the tubular appearance, uh, tubulo villus, villus, and so forth, um, not super high yield for step two or three. Now, inflammatory bowel, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, now, if the patient has an immediate family member with colon cancer or a history of advanced polyp, then you're going to start screening these people at 40 years of age. So mom got colon cancer. I got a friend whose mom just died from colon cancer last year. I told him, you got to get your uh, first colonoscopy when you're 40. He's, I think, 33. So he's got a, a, a ways to go. Um, but if you have a family member, a first degree family member uh, with who's had colon cancer or an advanced polyp, you will start screening those people at age 40 or at 10 years minus, or well, the person's age minus 10 years. So mom got colon cancer at 43, you're getting your colonoscopy at 33. Um, so it's whatever is sooner, 40 or 10 years before the age of the family member, whichever comes first. And then these people with that family history, they're going to get screened every five years, not every 10 years. Inflammatory bowel disease is going to depend on the extent of the colon involvement, and they'll be surveilled every one to two years. So that's important to know that we're surveilling those people more frequently. Now getting into these syndromes, hereditary non-polyposis syndrome or Lynch syndrome, that's a congenital condition that raises the risk of colon cancer, and it's diagnosed by history. So it's the three, two, one rule. They have to have three or more relatives diagnosed with colon cancer. They need to be in two or more generations, so a sister and a parent, or a, um, a grandparent and a parent. Um, those would, would all be fine. Uh, and then one of them needs to be a premature diagnosis, so under the age of 50. You'll start surveillance at 20 to 25 and then repeat every one to two years. These patients have a lifetime risk of 31 to 66 percent. Obviously, that's six to 10 times more than the general population. This is what a polyp looks like. This is a pedunculated polyp, and they're very easy to, to remove. When you see one of these, these tend to be benign, but we still need to remove them. And it's nice because you just go in with your snare, hit it here at the stock, and you can pull it out quite easily. On the other hand, a sessile polyp, they can be not only difficult to see on uh, colonoscopy, but they're also a... MFB to, uh, to, to 
take out. Um, so a lot of times you can't take the whole thing out, but if you can take out some of it, um, you may see dysplasia. Okay, so we'll talk about a few more uh, colon syndromes, premalignant colon syndromes here. Uh, I don't want to hit too hard on it because they're low yield, but you should have a passing familiarity with each of these. Okay, so familial adenomatous polyposis, or FAP, or FAP. No, not that kind of FAP. Get your mind out of the gutter. This is a mutation of the APC gene, uh, and it leads to the development of hundreds to thousands of polyps. Their colons are absolutely florid with polyps, and you'll know this immediately. 100% of these patients go on to develop colon cancer by age 50, so this is going to impact our management. These patients are generally asymptomatic until they develop colon cancer, which you'll usually see in these patients, and this is why it's always important to get a family history in your pediatric patients, is that they'll have a family member who is diagnosed with colon cancer at age 40 or younger. That's a dead giveaway, especially if they don't have, you know, IBS or anything like that. Uh, I'm sorry, IBD. Uh, diagnosis and surveillance, they're going to get their colonoscopy starting in adolescence, and they'll get it every one to two years. Now, some recommend you can do a, uh, a flex sig, a flexible sigmoidoscopy, and then once you see their first polyp there, because that's where they tend to start, um, then you proceed with doing colonoscopies. It's a pain in the butt, no pun intended, to get colonoscopies on a child, because think of all that prep work, right, and having them down all that uh, peg, not fun. So we want to try to avoid it, but unfortunately, it is something we have to do. Once you estimate more than 100 polyps on a colonoscopy, they're sent off to surgery for a total colectomy and an ilioanal pull-through. More about that in my surgery talks. The genetic testing for APC mutation is available. If they do have that mutation and it's, it's proven that they do, you go immediately to treatment. This is what you see on colonoscopy. I mean, it's a dead giveaway. These are all polyps. And most of these appear sessile too, which is bad news. Gardner syndrome is a variant of FAP. So it's an APC mutation. It's just a different mutation. And these patients will have a predilection not only for colon cancer, but for soft tissue tumors, and particularly osteomas. And they commonly present in the mandible. This is often something that a dentist will find when they're doing uh, their yearly x-rays. Um, and so they'll find these osteomas. And um, they know darn well when they see osteomas, multiple osteomas in the jaw, um, they're going to be sending them off to their doctor. Colon cancer, uh, painless lower GI bleeding, obviously, we talked about. Osteomas, we just talked about. Multiple lipomas, they're clinically evident, little bumps in the skin. Supernumerary teeth, dentists will notice this. Epidermal inclusion cyst, also clinically evident. These patients will also, just like FAP, uh, they'll be getting colonoscopies in adolescence every one to two years. This is what we talked about here. Boom, osteoma. Very important that you know what that looks like and where it tends to show up, the mandible. Here's another one. Okay, so here, again, you see arrows pointing. Um, I don't know what happened with this guy's teeth. Um, he's missing quite a few, but uh, you should have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. So he's missing like five teeth. You should have 16 on the bottom, 16 on the top. This is also an osteoma that you can actually see. Brush your teeth. This is supernumerary teeth. Now, this happens in a lot of things, but if you see this in conjunction with an osteoma, it's almost uh, certainly your diagnosis here. So remember I said 32 teeth? This is more than 32 teeth. You don't need to be a dentist to diagnose this. As a matter of fact, you probably don't even need to be a, anything to diagnose this. This obviously looks wrong. Juvenile polyposis, these patients tend to develop hamartomas. Now, hamartomas are not cancerous. However, these patients are still at risk for colon cancer. 40% will develop colon cancer, so again, about eight times more than the general population. They also have a predilection to develop gastric cancer, so that's going to impact our management. These patients, again, tend to be asymptomatic, um, and when it does present, it's often painless lower GI bleeding, which is often cancer, but it could be, a, I suppose, a hamartoma that fell off or something like that. This is the most common cause of lower GI bleed in children over the age of one. What was the most common GI bleed in older adults? 
diverticulitis. The diagnosis here, again, colonoscopy with biopsy, you'll find hamartomas. And then the surveillance, we're going to do both upper and lower scopes starting at age 18 and at least every three years. And the reason is because we are concerned about the development of gastric cancer. Now, some other disorders, putz jaeger syndrome, which I'm sure you've heard of. Uh, it's common on step one. This is primarily a non-GI disorder, but there are so many cancers that these patients are at risk for. Colon cancer, about 40%. Breast cancer, uh, half of these patients can develop breast cancer. Gastric cancer, ovarian cancer, pancreatic cancer. There are a number of things that we do differently to screen these patients, including for pancreatic cancer, which we normally don't screen for. Um, so uh, there are a lot of recommendations for these patients here. We're gonna just focus on GI though. Um, so we do do an EGD and colonoscopy because of the risk for gastric cancer starting at age 18, at least every three years. Now, these patients will tend to have hyperpigmented spots, particularly on the oral and buccal mucosa. You will be given that on your exam if you're expected to diagnose putz jaeger syndrome. I got a picture of that. I'll show you in the next slide. Turcot syndrome or Turcot syndrome, because this was a French Canadian, uh, is a genetic association between brain tumors, particularly gliomas, and colon cancer. So the brain and the colon. The way I remember it is Turco, like turban, and turban you wear on the head. So there's the brain cancer and then the colon cancer. And here you can see cafe au lait spots. So this is a hyperpigmented lesion. So there's not many things that do this other than puts Jaegers. So you tend to see it uh, around the nostrils, the lips, and then the uh, oral mucosa. And sometimes you can see it on the, the palms and the soles of the feet, the hands and feet, respectively. These are cafe au lait spots. They look kind of like birthmarks. Um, but uh, if you're seeing them in conjunction with uh, a patient um, that does have um, any kind of cancer, colon cancer, brain cancer, you should think Turco syndrome. 